thank you very much. Uh, it's quite an honor to be in a TED uh, conference. You know, when you hear people like uh, you know Ken Robinson or Celine Alvarez, you know, you get this goosebump, and so it's it's really moving. Uh, and so um, for me, it's it's really um, you know one of the talks I, I've seen online uh, is a TED talk by Alison Gopnik, and she became a friend now, and she has shown that indeed we were all born scientists. Okay, babies are born scientists, and we were all babies one day as far as I can remember. Um, and so that's, that's, that's the point. So um, she wrote books like this one, uh, The Scientist in the Crib, and you know, there is nice illustrations you can find online. Uh, and I'm sure that you know, all of you have you know, I've seen children, and maybe some of you remember uh, yourself as a child. Uh, and in fact, you know, what are chi children doing? Basically, they make observation, they form hypotheses, they do experiments, they analyze the data, and they report the findings, uh, and eventually they can invite others to reproduce the results. Okay, uh, and you can clearly see that you know there is also ethical questions uh, behind scientific questions, um, and and so we were all uh, born like this. Okay, some of us were lucky enough to be allowed to remain like this for a while, and uh, you know got. Uh, those talents, natural talents, developed, and others, for some reason, were not allowed to ask questions, they were not allowed to do experiments, they were not allowed to do many things. Okay, and that's why, you know, uh, it's interesting to see what Celine does in her class, because clearly she allows all this process to happen again and again and again, and that's the way the children learn so beautifully. Um, and what's interesting is that, you know, there is people that have kept that, even though for many years they were not in the scientific world. Okay, and that's typically patients. Okay, so uh, Temple Grandin, for instance, is uh, was an autist. Okay, and she made research on herself to try to uh, be able to live normally and to study normally. And now she's a university professor. Okay, uh, uh, Sharon Terry uh, in the middle is um, someone quite amazing. She didn't study science at all, and one day she went to the doctor with her two children, and she discovered that the two of them had the same disease. Okay, and it was a very rare genetic disease, and you know, today she has 100 scientific publication on the disease of her children. Okay, so she's been quite amazing uh, because of this. Okay, Stephen uh, is also a dear friend. He's uh, currently in Paris uh, with us. Uh, he had this profile in, in Science Magazine, the top uh, scientific journal, uh, that called him the visionary. Okay, because he's trying to say that in fact any patients can become a scientist and can contribute as you know, I was saying about Temple or, or Sharon, uh, to the progress of science because you know, those people are impatient. Okay? We call them patient, we ask them to be patient. You know, they want to be impatient, they want to uh, solve those problems as fast as possible. Okay? Um, and in fact, you know, all of us can be citizens and contribute to, uh, as citizens to the, to the knowledge production. Many of you probably uh, you know, at least have read Wikipedia and maybe have even you know, contributed to it and we can you know, talk about how to re-evolve it. Uh, many of you may you know, be active in DIY communities, do it yourself, so you may contribute to uh, learn and do uh, together. Uh, and this is happening in more and more fields. And more and more fields uh, like biology and, and robotics and mathematics and, and astronomy and so on are gathering citizens that contribute to science. Okay? What I like is, is this um, bottom uh, image where you see a 14-year-old that in Chile was caught in an earthquake. Okay, that's a rather stressful thing. Okay? So he wanted to be warned in advance for the next earthquake. So he took his cell phone Okay, and you know in cell phone there's accelerometers. Okay? And he was basically using the technology in the cell phone and the software in the cell phone. He hacked all this and he made the detectors of earthquake from his cell phone. Okay? That is able to send SMS to his friends whenever this happens. Okay? And now he has many friends and they have a whole network through Twitter uh, that will tell you uh, whether an earthquake is coming near, nearby. Okay? And, um, there is even gamers that can become scientists. Okay, so uh, some friends in in uh, Seattle have developed uh, games that will allow people to solve problems that neither computers nor scientists can solve alone. Okay, so that's quite an amazing achievement, and uh, they that's why they, they were in Nature, which is the top scientific journal as well. You know, and they, you call it people power because you had three hundred thousand people playing these games, and teams of tens of people contributing to solve challenges, such as a challenge that you can see on the left panel there, where um, the gamers have solved a AIDS problem that uh, scientists had not been able to solve for more than a decade. Um, 
And in fact, kids are very good uh, at solving challenges. I mean, we heard it uh, from some of the talks of today, like Celine's, uh, but you know, you probably have seen these things, okay? Uh, here, um, there is a quite an old picture, okay? Already at the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s, the old man that you see, Seymour Papert, was convinced that children could learn to program and to learn, and learn about robotics. Uh, and he gave them, you know, challenges that were so exciting, the kids, you know, went for it and solved them, okay? And they were learning amazing things, okay? And the, the sort of uh, uh, intellectual child of, uh, of Papert is this software called Scratch, okay? And you can literally program with blocks, like forever, imagine, program, share, okay? And you can do exactly this, okay? So children uh, from six years old can learn to code, okay? So you can try it home uh, with your, you know, children or nephews and so on. And, and so that's quite an amazing achievement. And if you see the little girl uh, on the top right, she's uh, recently been received by Barack Obama in the White House because She's Sylvia Awesome Maker Show, uh, and she has 1.5 million people that have followed her on Twitter, on, on YouTube, okay? Because she loves, you know, to do electronics and to build rockets and to do, uh, you know, crazy things like she wants to have a necklace that um, change uh, with the, her, her own heartbeat, okay? So she builds the world uh, hardware and software behind this so that it works, okay? And then she explains it in beautiful videos and everybody loves her. Okay, including Barack Obama. Um, and I don't know, you know, the biggest surprise, because I, I keep, I mean, all, everything I was telling you were, were surprised for me a few years ago, okay? So this is a surprise a few years ago again, and this is the youngest authors of scientific papers, okay? And as you can see on the top right, this was children eight to 10 years old. Okay? So, you know, this for me was an amazing surprise. You know, I saw that you needed a PhD or at least, you know, to have a, a parents that will help you to, to do crazy things. And this is, if you look at the bottom uh, left, this is Blackaton Primary School in Devon. Okay, so this is the middle of nowhere uh, in England. And, you know, sort of the world class uh, contributed to this scientific paper. Okay? And you, know, you can see their principal finding just here, and they say that you know, they've discovered some specific behaviors of bees, but they also discovered that science is cool and fun. Okay? Um, and because you get to do stuff that no one has ever done before. Okay? And that's very, very exciting for children. Okay? Uh, you know, when they can do something that they've never done, they're already thrilled. But if they can do stuff that no one ever has done, then you know, it's magic. And um, so what is science and how did science start? Okay? Basically, there is a very nice history book by Eisenstein that describes that it's thanks to printing that science was able to, to start growing. Um, and, and you can see the numbers of scientific publication has grown exponentially uh, since the beginning of the 18th century. So today there is one million fold more scientific papers than 300 years ago. So clearly no one can read everything anymore. Uh, but we are currently about to reinvent the very discovery process and make it available to many more people, such as children, gamers, patients, and so on. And there is a whole book that describes this. Um, but for me, there is another question, which is, you know, there is basically a notion of knowledge, okay? The question, you know, the volume is just amazing, millions of papers. But what about say, the depth of this ocean, okay? And so how can we measure the depth, okay? So you can do it very simply, you know, you take any children that comes and ask you, you know, why is the sky blue or why is the water wet, okay? Which is children, uh, typical questions. Uh, apparently in England, they had such a question. And what do you do with such a question? Already they are not very easy to answer. But if you, even if you've studied you know, water, uh, and then you can answer that question, they ask you why you give this answer, and then you start feeling shaky. Okay? And if you give a second answer, then you know, they ask you another why, and basically you're dead unless you're a Nobel Prize winner, uh, and, and you can may survive uh, for four whys, but that's basically the maximum. Okay? Uh, I know it, you know, my children caught me in this game, uh, even on the topics I was studying. Okay? So the depth of our knowledge, is very shallow, okay? And I think that's, that's an important point. So in fact, it's not so complicated to reach the frontiers of the unknown, okay? If you want to know everything, that's impossible. But if you want to reach the frontiers of the unknown and get this excitement, that's possible. And why is it possible? It's partly because the technology is transforming the world into a laboratory these days, okay? Uh, so I don't know if you realize it, but basically the NASA use a lot of computing power to go to the moon. But this is much less than any cell phone you have in your pocket. Okay? Uh, so the question you can start thinking about is, how often do you go to the moon? Okay? What is the moon you would like to conquer? 
Okay? So how would you go for something like this? Uh, and you can turn your cell phone into a scientific instrument. This is a cell phone that was turned into a microscope. Okay? Uh, and this is a cell phone that was transformed into a way to measure happiness globally, okay? because they have the right app called Mappiness. Okay? Uh, this guy has invented a microscope that, is, that costs only $1. Okay, uh, and if you want to sequence, you know, the, the stuff that is in the hand here is a, uh, a sequencer. It used to be nearly as big as this room. Okay, today you can sequence a human genome uh, for a million fold less than 10 years ago, and if you wait 10 more years, it will cost a million fold less again. Okay, this is crazy. Okay, everybody will be able to sequence, you know, everything that they would want to sequence. Okay, so basically the technology is there. You can sequence everything you want. And so th there should be a sort of a revolution uh, within universities. But if you look at you know, a middle-aged university and you compare it with a, a two-day classroom, you know, like this one, it's not so different, except maybe for the, the way you're dressed. Okay? Uh, that's the main difference. Okay? Um, and you know, they are currently uh, trying to revolutionize it through uh, internet-based courses, such as Massive Online Open Course or MOOCs. But it's, again, very top-down. You've got one guy talking to tens or taking to tens of thousands. But it's still the top-down way of exchanging information, which, unfortunately, I have to do just now. Okay? So that's a problem. Okay? This is not evolving as fast as the rest of society, and it's not imparting people with this ability to, to develop their scientific skills. But you have teachers like Céline that are scientists. Okay? They are observing the way the children learn, and they are trying to help them always. And they are trying, whenever something fails, she's trying to uh, see how to improve it all the time. Okay? So they are not only scientists, they are also change makers, as you've just heard. And there is another uh, fantastic teacher I love very much called uh, Anne Jansour, and that's a picture of her classroom. And you can see it's not a classical French classroom. Okay? This is again in a, in a disfavored uh, neighborhood in uh, Bagneux, and, uh, where she was last year with fantastic kids. And you can see she was opening her classroom to other adults, and she was even uh, opening this, and she was giving frames of freedom, very much like what Céline is doing to the children. So there is a frame, it's not complete anarchy, but there is a lot of freedom that the children can uh, enjoy, and they can ask their own question, and they can develop their own scientific projects. And so, basically, the, the take-home message is that none of us is as smart as all of us, that we can come together and solve issues that we could not solve alone. Okay? So this is a Japanese proverb I like very much, but it's also that you know, together we can, we can become tall. And you know, that, for me, is interesting because this is a quote from Newton at the very beginning of science. He was saying, if I have been able to see far, it's because I was standing on the shoulders of giants. Okay? And so that's you know, good teachers, good patients, you know, everyone that, that wants to become a scientist reads a lot and tries to climb the shoulders of giants. And even children want to uh, be on the shoulders of giants. And we have to help them to reach you know, the shoulders of Einstein or others uh, to be able to reach the next step. So th those are the, the challenges we really uh, would like to, to be able to, to think about. And in fact, those challenges are nearly are, are very old. Okay? This is the uh, beginning of the 19th century. And you know, this guy is uh, von Humboldt with some of his friends. Clearly, they're all aristocrats, white males. Uh, but they are refunding the university based on this principle. They say the university teacher is no longer a teacher and the student no longer a pupil. They have to conduct res the students should conduct research and the professor supervised this research and supports him. Okay? So that's, uh, for me, a, a key sentence. And so this was the funding of modern university, especially typically American university. Even the Humboldt University in Germany is not based on this principle, okay? uh, very strangely. But today, what he was saying is that you have to, ha to be free to learn, free to teach, and free to do research. Okay? And today, thanks to internet, we are able to do these three things simultaneously. Okay? So we are able to accomplish the dreams of, of uh, this man. And that's, again, you know, uh, Ange Ansour class. You have the picture of Ange there, and you've got the pictures of, of some of the kids working with her. And you can see this is their lab in their class. Okay? At the end of the classroom, they are doing experiments, and they are trying to know whether ants will go to the left or to the right uh, in this set. But they also have observed that ants were building their own uh, walls that no one had ever seen before. And you, could, you should have seen the excitement of these children when they realized that the answer of their question was not on the internet. It was not in the hands of experts. Nobody 
nobody had the answer. The only way to get the answer was to do an experiment, and they were the first in the world to discover this. Okay? Uh, and not only did they discover a lot about science, they discovered also a lot about themselves, about their ability to work in a group, about their ability to uh, co-produce knowledge together, and they were improving their literacy, their collaboration, and all sorts of, uh, of skills. So basically, what we're about to build uh, in Paris is a new building. Uh, on the top uh, left, you have a picture of this. So the city hall of Paris gave us 6,000 square meters. And we want to bring together people that are change makers of education, that want to rethink uh, about innovation, education, science, technology, and arts, and put them together in what we call this open fiesta mode. Okay? So we'd like to be able to uh, uh, do these things together. And the aim of what we have is, you know, we would like to invite everybody that want to imagine innovative solutions that basically do not exist yet, but are within reach. Such, uh, and, and I think this illustration is, is rather nice. You know, I, I find myself very often in this situation. Okay? Very often I, I'm behind bars and I don't know those bars. I think that you know, there is a natural limit uh, and I have to, it's only when I've overcome those barriers that I can see things. Okay? So every slides I've presented to you today is basically such barriers. Okay? In the last years, many different barriers have fallen in my own brain, and I think that there is probably still many more barriers to go, but I think that together uh, we can uh, overcome uh, ever more barriers and, and let uh, more people uh, learn together and create the future of education and research simultaneously. Thank you very much. <laughs>